Hello, Elevating Life Church. How are you doing this morning? Oh, I kind of anticipated that this morning. It is good to see you. It is good to be with you on this final Sunday of August in 2021, where we are rapidly uh, getting into the harvest season. Anybody notice that with the allergies? Oh, it's been wonderful, hasn't it? Uh, it's been great. The harvest season where we, let me say it this way this morning, get uh, where we get to pick the fruit of our labor to enjoy the satisfaction of nature. We're going to say God's nature this morning. And people working together to produce a bountiful crop for all to enjoy. So again, it is good to be with you on this last Sunday of August. Now, for, for those who may be wondering who I am, uh, my name is Drake. I'm the Senior Directing Pastor here at Elevating Life Church. And let me say welcome. Thank you for being here. Welcome to our guest. Welcome to our family members. Welcome to those who are uh, on uh, Facebook with us, those different social media platforms. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Now, today, uh, I want to bring a message about discerning and deciphering the blooming, or should I say thriving Christian from the one who is out of season or not relevant in the faith. Now, all good Christians strive to be mature and in bloom in the time, space, and place God has given them to do so. If this is not the case, then the Christian is cursed and out of the will of God. To begin our very serious message this morning, we will read from the book of Matthew chapter 11 to start the good news, the message that I've titled, Picking Good Fruit. Picking Good Fruit is the title of our message. Now, uh, as you are getting to Matthew chapter 11, as uh, we traditionally do here, uh, let me ask you a question. Here's our question this morning. Currently, do you feel you're producing good results in the faith? Not subjectively speaking, objectively speaking. Do you feel you're producing good results in the faith, or is your life barren of God's fruit where people go hungry and they experience you? It's a very simple question. You're either producing God's fruit, objectively speaking, or you are not. Now, this question this morning, is your reality one way or another? And that is what we're going to find out this morning, to find out uh, what that is all, or to, excuse me, to answer that question in the message, again, that I've titled, Picking Good Fruit. So with that, read with me our opening verse, Mark 13, excuse me, Mark 11, verse 13. Here it is. John Mark is the writer here. And I'm going to introduce this core verse, and we're going to come back not only to this verse, but we're going to look at the episode, if you will, in the Bible where Jesus curses the fig tree. And we're going to find out what that is today. So here's John Mark in his uh, penmanship, if you will. And seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, this is important. He, Jesus, went to see if he could find anything on it. When he came to it, he found, what's the next word? Nothing. But leaves. For it was not the season for figs. Now, some of us might interpret this as, well, it might be winter time, or it might be, that's not what this is saying. And I guarantee you, we're going to look at it. It means that this tree was not fulfilling its purpose. So with our core verse read this morning, 
join me in prayer, as we decipher what it means to be a Christian in the delight of the Lord always in season. So people can pick the ripe, good fruit of God that hangs from your reality or your personality or in the reality of who you are and what you do in this world. So with that, let's pray. Lord, we praise your fruitful name. And we thank you for the privilege to feed hungry souls of this world. And we are sorry for being barren and not producing your results. As your people, we ask for divine wisdom to nourish properly, to develop to maturity and a healthy existence to serve your goodness. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Today, with our contemporary board game theme for 2021, we're using the game, as you've already seen, Hi-Ho Cheerio. That's fun to say. Hi-Ho Cheerio. Now, this game has a particular sweet spot in my heart. The reason, well, if you know me, it's a game my granddaughter and I often play even to this game. It's a game that sits in our coffee table there in the living room. It's the first game she goes to. And Hi-Ho Cheerio is what is known as a child's put-and-take game, as we saw on uh, the video. But it's that put-and-take, very simple game. So two to four players start with a basket. Each spin a spinner that's on the board and attempt to collect the, the fruit hanging from their tree. Of course, the fruit in this game is cherries. At each player's turn, they spin, and whatever number they fall on, or dilemma, there's problems there that go with that, but whatever number or dilemma the player lands on, they follow through appropriately. And the first player to collect all the fruit from their tree and calls, hi-ho, cheerio, wins the game. It's ours of fun with a three- or four-year-old child, even though my granddaughter is eight years old now. She loves playing it because it brings her back to those memories because we've been playing it for years now. So just fun, fun, fun with my granddaughter, Lily Pat, again, who has a just a small, little special place in my heart, if you didn't know that. But let me say this. Unlike... The cherry trees in the board game, Hi-Ho Cheerio, the fig tree Jesus approaches in our core verse has no fruit on it. It's barren and, and not fulfilling its purpose. And it is an interesting moment in the ministry, the earthly ministry of Jesus, and a moment we must understand if we are to be fulfilled and responsible in the purpose that God has given us on this side of our breath, eternity's breath. So let's do this. Let's go back and read the full, let's say, scene, if you will, that's going on, the episode of the cursed fig tree to fill our hungry souls with God's nourishing fruit so that we can often say, hi-ho, cheerio for the win. Can we do that this morning? If you don't want to do it, well, <clears throat> Mark 11, verses 12 through 14 gives us all the verses we need to understand this particular lesson that Jesus is teaching. So let's go there. John Mark again writes this, on the following day. Now let me ask this question. Anybody know, Heather, you can't, anybody that's been in my rehearsal, you don't get to answer this. Anyone uh, know what the following day was in this verse? Anybody? It's close. Very close. 
The following day was the day that Jesus entered Jerusalem on the colt. Palm Sunday, traditionally speaking. So this would be Monday. Now understand, <laughs> traditionally speaking, don't be beating me up now, people that are listening to this, wherever you are. But understand, the following day was that triumphal day that Jesus entered, and, and it was Palm Sunday. But understand this too. They, uh, the disciples actually went back to Bethel. And Bethel is a little community outside of Jerusalem, about two and a half miles away. And now they're coming back, uh, they're, uh, coming back to Jerusalem the next day. They're literally coming back. And then he says, of course, on the following day when they came from Bethany. Did I say that? Bethany, yes. He, who is he? Jesus was hungry. Looking for a cracker barrel or something, I don't know. And seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf. This is our core verse now. He went to see if he could find anything on it. And when he came to it, the fig tree, he found nothing but leaves. For it was not the season for figs. Now we know why it wasn't. For he said this, now Jesus, and he said to it, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard it. We need to pause here because they heard it. Because what was going to happen in just a few days? The death of Jesus Christ and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we have to understand that here because this is a significant lesson. Jesus has a few more days and we have to say, ooh, this is a huge lesson. And Jesus is truly making his point here before he gets to the problem of the cross and then the purpose of God, the resurrection. So his disciples heard it, meaning his disciples knew this wasn't just another moment to leave church or an opportunity just to eat practically. But it was a moment Jesus was using to teach and feed a vital lesson of life. Are you with me? Let me ask you, disciples, are you listening? That means, are you hearing it? Not only that, but you're going to receive this lesson and apply it. Because if not, you got some problems coming in just the next few days. I hope you are listening. I hope so, because your reality depends on it. So understand, your truth, again, is one way or another. It's either healthy in the Lord, that's living in the delight of the Lord now, or you are cursed like this fig tree that bears no fruit as we see in our core verse this morning. It's one way or another. This is seeing and facing reality. What did I preach last week? Reality. Y'all forgot that message already? That's the reason we preached it last week. Now, re reading the experience of the cursed fig tree, I believe, I believe most know the problem Jesus, Jesus is deciphering. The issue, the problem, is that many people accept Christ and identify with him, him being God, of course, but fail to carry out their God-given purpose. Their God-given purpose of producing good outcomes spiritually and practically. Are you with me? We all want to come to church spiritually. No, 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 no. It is a full picture, integrity. It's spiritually and practically speaking. They, these Christians, identify with Christ in their beliefs, but never honestly act on them to do God's mission. So many people identify with Jesus, but very few produce the fruit needed to draw people into the delight of the Lord here and now to increase God's 
goodness. And as we often say here at Elevating Life Church, we identify these folks as religious people. Ever met somebody who goes to church and does not fulfill the purpose of God? Religious people who identify themselves week after week in their denomination or whatever that might be, they identify themselves as Christ followers but fail to produce God's good results to serve others for all to enjoy in the delight of the Lord. As Jesus shared in Mark 11, this Christian is cursed. I didn't write it. It's there. May no one eat from these wicked Christians again. Who's with me this morning? Now, before resolving the problem of isolation, self-reliance, self-sufficiency, it's just me and God, that is a myth. pride, everything, before we resolve this problem, let's understand the significance of a fig tree in the Bible to understand Jesus' point of cursing one just days before his death on the cross and the resurrection. Now, to do so, we need to understand some other trees in the Bible. Now, when reading the Bible, when you're actually reading it, there's a lot of Christians that call themselves Christians. They don't even pick up their Bible all week, I promise you. But when reading the Bible intentionally, quickly up front, you'll run across three trees in the first three chapters of Genesis. Those trees are the tree of life, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and the fig tree. So let's briefly look at the three so we can gain an understanding of what Jesus is teaching here. So the first tree, of course, is the tree of life. Now, most are aware this tree sits in the midst or in the middle and at the highest point in God's garden. This tree is the holy of holy trees. It represents God's life and creative power that is made available to all people. When a person chooses to eat from this beautiful, let me say unified, truthful, that's reality, and very good tree, they are actually indress, uh, excuse me, ingesting God's own life. It's transforming the one who eats it. Or in other words of, uh, of the Bible, the biblical story, excuse me, it leads to eternal life, period. Now this tree, please hear this this morning, is naturally objective. You understand? That's the first tree, the objective tree, the tree of life. The second tree in the garden is the tree of knowing good and evil. And God said with this tree, symbolically speaking, you have a choice. You have free will and you have free choice. You have a choice. You can eat of it if you want. However, if you do, no, it will poison and kill you. That's God's words. It will poison and kill you. Nevertheless, God said, you have an option. If you do, or excuse me, you have an option, which, let me say this, still implies to us or applies today. Are you with me? This tree represents taking the authority to do good and evil in your own eyes and decipher life generated based on your feelings, on your emotions, and on your moods, what you like. You know why a lot of people aren't here this morning? Because they didn't feel like coming to the church or church. 
They don't like the music. They don't like that preacher. Good night, all he does is preach. Very, very, very uh, subjective indeed. Is there anything wrong with subjectivity? No. But understand this, it's right when you're properly using it. When you're living by principles, not by your interpretation of how you feel or your mood or how God is speaking to you through your feelings. You're not favored. We're all the children of God. And when we decide to follow His direction objectively and allow our feelings to be part of the experience, then we're living in the will of God. We have to understand this because it is destroying a lot of relationships, killing a lot of churches. And isn't it shameful right now? There's some churches that are full in our community right now, and that's because they're there because they're, they, they, they subjectively they feel guilty. They've been shamed to go by their family. Or they've been so condemned that if they don't go, they're people pleasers. And they're there because of those feelings. Rather than going to say, we're going to live by the objective reality of God, and we're going to believe it, and we're going to put action towards it. See, when you have that freedom, you have a choice, and you're not pressured by it. People run wild because they can do whatever they want. But the true Christian will be here, taking the direction of God in his alignment and moving forward so that then we can live like, as Dave Ramsey puts it, like no other. Sorry, I had to go there, Matt. We get to give, and then we get to uh, be responsible. Then we live the lifestyle. After the fact, it is awesome. Nothing wrong with subjectivity, but replace it with God's objectivity. All hell breaks loose. And if you don't believe me, you'll know them by their fruit. Is this world, is our country messed up? Come on. Let's start looking at reality. Nothing wrong with subjectivity, but you turn it around. We have a serious, serious problem. Never forget, God is the object of our faith, and you are the subject of it. If you get this backwards, understand, and you decide to live in that lifestyle, you are a cursed Christian, period. This is where the third tree comes into the picture now. That's the second tree, which is knowing good and evil. And choosing, you have a choice. But you choose to eat from your subjective tree, you're just going to die, as we see Adam and Eve doing after the fall. But the third tree mentioned is the fig tree that represents the child or children of God in relationship with him or one way or another. So one is the tree of life, and the other is the tree of death that curses the Christian who thinks they're all that in a bag of Doritos with the Mountain Dew on the side because they are going to live in the philosophy of, I'll do what I want. They live in the plague of this world. And as Jesus shared again, it's this Christian who is a cursed Christian. We know a Christian is cursed. Uh, is, excuse me. We know a Christian is cursed because rather than producing figs, fruit, God's fruit, they use the resources God gives them, the fig leaf cover up their guilt, shame, and embarrassment in their isolated and self-sufficient way. Recall Adam and Eve using the fig trees, leaves to sew garments for themselves after eating the forbidden fruit. Rather than producing fruit, they used the supplies to cover the vulnerability part, their problems, their issues. Genesis 3, 7, 
when that happens, this is what the reality is, then the eyes of both of them were opened. And they realized they were naked. That's vulnerable. So they sewed all of their stuff together. All their materialistic stuff. They sewed it together to cover themselves. You ever met anybody that continues to shop and buy and cover themselves with stuff? Christian nation? Something to think about, isn't it? And I'll encourage you all to read Genesis 1 and 2 and 3 and research trees in the Bible to understand better these trees that I've mentioned today. Now, generally speaking, when you run across or you read a tree, not always, but most of the time in the Bible, it represents a choice needing to happen one way or another. So important to understand this. Because the Bible is to be deciphered. If you're a Christian, it says, well, why doesn't he just tell me the way it is? Because that's not the way it works. You've got to go and ask and seek and knock. And When you do that, he's going to give you the proper answer. And guess what? Most of the time, you're not going to like it. Why? Because it's not subjective. And so we have to understand that when we read the Bible... Those symbols, they mean something. Choice. And we all have free choice and free will. Now let me make something very clear this morning. You and I, in the symbolic use of this in the Bible, are fig trees. And let me say this. Fig trees are for making figs. Not for providing coverings. It's that simple. I want you to think about it. We plant apple trees because we want apples. We plant peach trees because we want orange trees because we want and fig trees because we want leaves. Figs. And you and I, again, in the imaginary uh, the imagery, I should say, excuse me, of the Bible represents the fig tree. Now let me ask you this. What good is an apple tree that doesn't produce apples, generally or in the ultimate purpose of that tree? I say that because to me you're a question, you, you will answer that your way, subjectively. What good is an apple tree that doesn't produce apples? you might as well cut it down or curse it, as Jesus did the fig tree. Likewise, for the Christian not to produce the fruit of God, nourished now with his love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, uh, faithfulness, and self-control. By, by the way, I need to pause here. That doesn't mean those are all different pieces or different fruits. I know that was the the example, but understand that there's only one fruit of God, and that's his goodness. And when you take a bite out of somebody's experience, just like you do an apple or a piece of fruit, you should taste all kinds of different flavors. And for the Christian, it's the nine fruits of the Spirit or the ingredients that makes up God's fruit. Are you with me? It's not nine different fruits. It's getting it all together. So that then when people experience you, you get to serve them with God's fruit. It's that simple. So again, likewise, for the Christian not to produce the fruit of God nourished with the, the fruits of the Spirit, you might as well cut it down or curse it. As Jesus implies with the lesson of the curse fig tree. Christians who are barren of God's fruit are entirely out of the will of God, isolated and stuck in their self-reliant methods, reality, and their lifestyle. They are cursed. Cursing the fig tree was Jesus' way of saying that the child or children of God, we can say that, the family, the church, whoever, what that one times one looks like, 
that the church and the people of God had become spiritually and practically burdened, or excuse me, barren before the Lord. And these unfruitful children, then and now, have a form of religion, but not the reality of living in God's garden. No, excuse me. I apologize. No, I don't. This is heartbreaking. <laughs> Known as the delight of the Lord. Now, another way to put this is that religious people know the right words to say, but their hearts are far from God. Others, and becoming the person God designed them to be. And the sad part about this is that they reflect their earthly parents more than they do their heavenly parents. And the heavenly parents being God the Father and Mother Wisdom. Don't you think? I would say so. Isn't it time we follow Jesus' command, honor your parents in the Lord, to produce God's fruit properly, to serve a hungry world rather than being cursed in our isolated families, in our ways, in our prejudice, and in our, our silly ways that we live. Now, I've got to say this. I've got, got to give you this. What is the solution to the unfruitfulness, the isolation, and the self? What is the solution of all of these problems? Second Chronicles 7.14 gives us the answer. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. Notice this. It doesn't say in heaven because God sits above heaven and above earth. It's at that point that, that he will hear from heaven where you're living on earth because your values line up with his tree of life, the objective reality. And what does it say? I will forgive their sins, your mistakes, your transgressions, your transgressions, your, in, in, your iniquity, and will do what? Heal their land, the land you stand on. They will, he will heal your land. So today, rather than allowing this message to be subjective and feel good, or whatever that is for you, where you're deciphering it with your subjective intuition, won't you choose to be alive in God's objective way and, fail to be, and stop being distracted by those who don't care? His way you got to understand his way is eating from the tree of life, from the holy of holy trees, in turn producing healthy fruit through who you are and what you do. For those that are with us objectively, understand that eating from the tree of life, not the tree that destroys, is the tree of life that God has given us to eat from in this life, a life where people will experience you. Not as a barren and cursed Christian, but one who happily bears God's fruit for all to pick from when they encounter you. Please understand, when this is the case, I promise you, you'll get to yell, hi-ho, cheerio, often for the win. Ending where we began with the cursed fig tree. Mark eleven, thirteen. And seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf. He couldn't see if there was fruit or not. But then he got close to the tree. He went to see if he could find anything on it. 
And when he examined it, when he came to it, he found nothing but a bunch of crap. Leaves. For it was not the season for figs. Let's all make the choice to be in season every moment of every day. The message, folks, seriously. Picking good fruit. And let me say this, church, it's your move. Never stop. Don't, I don't want to say playing. Never stop growing. Amen?